Colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to present at the International Conference on Neurology and Neuroscience in Rome, Italy. I'm Christopher Kent, Director of Scholarly Activity at Sherman College of Chiropractic. The title of my presentation is Putative Neurobiological Mechanisms Associated with Vertebral Subluxation, a Review and Update. Vertebral subluxation is a clinical condition where there's a loss of the proper position or motion of a vertebral segment, which may impact proper nervous system function. In 1927, Stevenson described the phenomenon as a condition of a vertebra that has lost its proper juxtaposition with the one above, the one below, or both to an extent less than a luxation, which impinges nerves and interferes with the transmission of mental impulses. We know that mechanical and degenerative changes associated with vertebral subluxation may result in a variety of neurological consequences. In this cone beam CT examination, we can see the rotational malpositioning of the atlas or first cervical vertebra. The clinical significance of this depends on which anatomical structures are affected and which physiologic mechanisms are operationalized as a result. Some of the neurobiological mechanisms that have been described in association with vertebral subluxation include cord compression and adverse cord tension, nerve root compression, local irritation, vertebral artery compromise, autonomic dysfunction, coherence and oscillatory patterns, disafferentation and neuroplasticity, as well as disafferentation, dyskinesia, dyspanesis, dysautonomia, and ephaptic transmission. There are four major physical mechanisms associated with biological communication. The first is diffusion of particles along concentration gradients. And we're all familiar with this in terms of ionic transport, osmotic change, and the classic propagation of the nerve impulse. Second, we have diffusion of quanta along electromagnetic gradients. And this includes the various electrophysiologic phenomenon that we're familiar with and the various tools we have for assessing them. This would include things like EEG, ECG, EMG, and the like. Third, we have transmission of substances within structured channels. And the transmission of substance within structured channels can be scaled. On a cellular level, we're dealing with axoplasmic flow. And we know that interference with axoplasmic flow can adversely affect trophic function. We also can look at the transmission of blood through structured channels. Uh, if there is impingement or pressure upon an artery or vein, this can affect neural function in a variety of ways. We also know that transmission and circulation of cerebrospinal fluid is critical to proper neurological function, and that when there are alterations in the position or motion of a vertebra, this can interfere with CSF propagation. Finally, we have wave propagation, which is where we have compressive and rarefactive type phenomenon. A lot of modern study has gone into this. Heimberg describes mechanical pulses associated with the propagation of the nerve impulse. He notes that signals travel down a pike like a nerve fiber in a manner similar to a compression wave. As the wave front advances, it squeezes the lipid molecules, briefly changing them from a fluid to a liquid crystalline state, making them bulge and release heat. There's some controversy regarding this model, whether these mechanical phenomenon are secondary to the electric pulse we're all familiar with, the Hodgkin-Huxley model, or whether they're only side effects or secondary manifestations of that electric pulse. If we look at some of the mechanical factors that can disrupt the function of a nerve, 
we have compression and stretch. In the early 70s, Seth Sharpless at the University of Colorado found that spinal roots were far more susceptible to compression block than peripheral nerves, that a pressure of only 10 millimeters of mercury produced significant compression block. And to make that real for you, that's kind of the threshold of perception on the back of your hand or about the weight of a dime. Uh, in contrast, peripheral nerves require considerably more pressure to affect propagation of signal. Uh, some of the studies that Sharpless reviewed in that early paper suggested that forces of 100 to, in some cases, several hundred millimeters of mercury of pressure were necessary to block a peripheral nerve. So it was really an exciting finding to see that spinal roots were far more susceptible to compression block. And this is the arrangement that he used. He had a stimulator. Uh, here, of course, is the nerve. And he recorded the image uh, of the impulse on a storage oscilloscope, which allowed him to see what happened to the amplitude over time. A pressure transducer was used to record the amount of pressure that was placed in a balloon uh, and, and a plastic foot uh, underneath. So as the nerve was compressed, he could see uh, a decrease in the amplitude of the action potential as the compressive force increased. This was replicated by Kano's team and published in Spine in 1995, finding that compression of the nerve roots of the cauda equina with as little as 10 millimeters of mercury resulted in decreased action potentials. It was also noted that dysfunction is not confined to degeneration at the site of compression, but also extends to the primary sensory neurons within the dorsal root ganglion. We sometimes see cases where there's evidence of nerve root compression, but the classic neurological signs following a specific dermatome, uh, affecting specific muscles, and affecting specific reflexes may be absent. Radovic's team noted that venous blood flow to spinal roots was blocked with as little as five to 10 millimeters of mercury of pressure. This is that mechanism we discussed earlier about flow of fluids through structured channels. If venous blood flow is impeded, this can lead to retrograde venous stasis, causing congestion, causing swelling of the nerve root, which we can sometimes see on MRI. So in addition to the decrease in the amplitude of the action potential, we have impairment of nutrient flow to spinal nerves at similar low pressures. Well, people criticize some of this work um, and questioned its potential generalizability to humans uh, because it dealt with animals. However, in 2013, Ando's team looked at 114 surgical patients. They found that sensory nerve action potentials decreased in amplitude when the lesion was at or distal to the dorsal root ganglion. And the conclusion was that the amplitude of the snaps or sensory nerve action potentials with a lumbar foraminal stenosis should be decreased. Howes also noted that nerve root compression can exist without pain. And we frequently see patients with vertebral subluxation that have evidence of nerve root compression, but may be completely asymptomatic. Nonetheless, we see that there are changes in certain physiologic parameters, such as skin temperature patterns, uh, heart rate variability, uh, dermal patterns associated with uh, sweat gland activity. Uh, these things all indicate potential autonomic dysfunction. The local irritation can also lead to the presence of inflammatogenic agents, such as histamine or substance P, which may cause a chemical radiculitis. In addition, as mentioned, there may be disturbed CSF flow, and there may be sympathetic sensitization leading to what they've described as a vicious cycle. We can have sympathetically mediated pain. We can also have dysfunction of the autonomic system. Wall noted that stretch 
also changes the function of a nerve. And that at 6% strain, the amplitude of the action potential had decreased by 70% at one hour and returned to normal during the recovery period. So when we have alterations of spinal curves causing traction on the spinal cord as well as the nerve roots, uh, what was described as adverse mechanical tension on the cord by several investigators, this too can interfere with nerve conduction. So in this cadaveric specimen, uh, we can see the nerve roots of the caudi equina quite nicely, and we can see how when there is alteration of spinal curves and there's caudad traction on the phylum terminale, uh, this can lead to problems. The dentate ligaments can also be associated with alterations in cerebrospinal fluid flow, uh, deformation of the spinal cord itself, and changes in the tension of the nerve roots. Uh, here at the arrows, we can see the dentate ligaments, and they, of course, are somewhat variable in their form and configuration. In the craniocervical junction, we can see, of course, the cerebellar structures here. We can see the spinal cord at the turquoise arrows. We can see the vertebral arteries and that sort of tortuous hairpin turn that they take at C1, the atlas vertebra, and we can also see the nerve roots emerging from the cord. So if we take a close-up of that area, we can see how disruption of the position of the atlas vertebra can potentially affect a number of structures in the area, the spinal accessory nerve, the intracranial bentate ligaments, the posterior spinal artery, and of course, uh, C1. This problem is complicated in Chiari malformations where we have caudad migration of the cerebellar tonsils. Uh, so here, uh, we can see the anterior nerve roots on this MRI. The white stuff is the CSF. This is a T2-weighted image. Um, you can see here the dorsal roots. And at the small arrows, we can see the decreased signal intensity, which is the location of the dentate ligaments. If we look at the normal appearance of dorsal root cells in an experimental animal, uh, we can see that you know, we have nice staining of the cytoplasm, uh, the nucleus is intact, the nucleus looks good. But if there is an artificially induced spinal strain, if there is disruption of normal muscular activity causing asymmetrical forces to bear on the motion segment, we start to see some chromatolysis or decreased density in the staining uh, and as the process eventuates, uh, this becomes even more pronounced and can lead to uh, chromatolysis. Some functional changes that are associated with alterations in spinal conformation, misalignment of a vertebra, impingement of a nerve, interference with the propagation of impulses. One is disafferentation, and that's where the afferent input from the body is disrupted as a result of mechanical changes in the spine so that the information going to the brain is potentially corrupted. This was referred to as the neural image by Peterson and Himes, and they described it as being the body's perception of the internal and external environment. Uh, some IT people have suggested it's kind of a garbage in, garbage out situation where if the body isn't getting accurate information concerning what's going on in the periphery, it's not able to make the qualitative and quantitative changes necessary to adapt to environmental dynamics. And here we can see some of the structures that are involved. Uh, we have some very sophisticated uh, neural receptors in the posterior joints. Some are rapidly adapting, some are slow adapting. Uh, we have receptors in the ligaments and in the muscles of the spine. And all of this, along with information from viscera and cutaneous uh, receptors, um, special sense organs and the like, uh, give the body information concerning what's happening.
In the disc, the outer annulus has no susceptive fibers. Um, in the past, uh, some people questioned whether a disc could be a pain generator. Um, today, that's pretty well accepted because we know that there is a nerve supply to the human intervertebral discs, that there are neural elements in both cervical and lumbar discs that have been identified, that there are mechanoreceptor endings in human cervical facet joints. Uh, and here we can see um, two vertebral segments in the associated disc. Uh, this is the Spalteholtz process, which renders the bone translucent. The vessels have been injected with dye, so you can see them. So when we see end plate degeneration, that will accelerate degeneration of the disc. Uh, we also know that the supraspinal and interspinal ligaments are innervated, that there are nerve fibers uh, affecting the cranial and spinal meninges, and that the morphology of nerve fiber terminals is critical to its structural and functional integration. And if we look at examples of the spine uh, and the affected intervertebral foramen, uh, here we have a nice healthy level, and you can see the posterior joint is got good joint space. You can see the synovial membrane. You can see the ligament and flavum here. This is the nerve root, which is surrounded by fat, uh, designed to be protective, since it is so exquisitely sensitive to compression, and there are also vessels present. Contrast that to this specimen where we see degenerative change and uh, the cadaveric specimen at the right, you can see decreased interosseous spacing, anterior displacement of disc material and the developing osteophyte anteriorly. Notice, however, that the L4, L5 disc maintains good disc spacing. So this is not a manifestation of normal aging, it's indicative of pathomechanics. And on the film on your left, a T1-weighted magnetic resonance image, uh, the high signal intensity is due to the presence of, of marrow, uh, marrow fat specifically. And we can see that that marrow fat has been replaced by something else. And if we look at the water image, the T2-weighted image, we can see that there's evidence of, of edema, suggestive of an inflammatory process, and that the disc here, between L4 and L5, which has good spacing on the images, is in fact desiccated and disrupted. And as we noted, that too can be a pain generator, could also be associated with sympathetic and related autonomic dysfunction. So in the degenerative cascade, we have abnormal spinal mechanics causing a tugging on the ligaments, focal inflammation, uh, the yellow marrow is eventually going to displace the red marrow, the hemopoietic marrow, and with time, osteophytes will form. Uh, we can see that here, where we have corrugation and hypertrophy of the ligament flavum. We have an entrapped nerve root, and we have a posterior osteophyte. And you can see how the distribution of this yellow degenerative material varies from level to level, depending on the various uh, forces that are brought to bear as a result of abnormal biomechanics. So if you look at this motion MRI in a relatively normal person, you can see uh, things are moving nicely and the space between the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies and the cord is clean. Whereas here we have abnormal motion in the upper cervical spine that's leading to degenerative change down here and you can see as the person flexes and extends, there's impression on the anterior aspect of the thecal sac and the cord. This disrupts CSF flow. And in this case where we see even more advanced degenerative change, uh, we can appreciate how this osteophyte is causing cord compression, and we can see the disruption of the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. A manifestation of nerve function is neuroplasticity. And basically, neuroplasticity results in both anatomical and functional changes 
in the brain itself. As Holloway wrote, change the input, be it a behavior, a mental exercise, or a physical skill, and the brain changes accordingly. Disafferentation, or abnormal afferent input to the brain, may cause problems. Indeed, not all neuroplastic changes are favorable, and it's been hypothesized that maladaptive neuroplastic changes may be associated with vertebral subluxations. Another manifestation of vertebral subluxation is dyskinesia. And that's where there's a disconnect between a voluntary motion that a person wishes to execute and the ability to do so. So dyskinesia relates to phasic action. We can measure it with inclinometry. We can look at dynamic surface EMG to see if there is symmetry, uh, if there are areas of increased activity as the person executes a move that are asymmetrical and may indicate aberrant loading. We can also utilize motion studies such as video fluoroscopy or as you just saw, motion MRI. Somewhat related is dysponesis. And dysponesis comes from the Greek meaning toil or exertion. And dysponesis relates to tonic muscle activity. Dorland's dictionary defines it as a reversible physiopathologic state consisting of unnoticed, misdirected neurophysiologic reactions to various agents. These agents may be environmental events, bodily sensations, emotions, and thoughts. They look at the repercussions of these reactions throughout the organism. And dysponesis really relates to errors in energy expenditure, which can create functional disorders due to unseen errors in action potential output from the motor and premotor areas of the cortex and the consequences of that output. So if we have aberrant afferent input, our ability to respond appropriately with tonic responses can be compromised and clinically we can measure this with surface electromyography. Dyspanesis is correctable, it's reversible, it's associated with abnormal function, there are repercussions throughout the organism. And in our profession of chiropractic, we place tremendous emphasis on how the vertebral subluxation affects a person's ability to express their potential as a human being on many levels. And we're seeing this acknowledged more and more in the mainstream literature. Dyspanesis is associated with errors of energy expenditure that may cause functional disorders. Another phenomenon that we see and are able to measure objectively is dysautonomia. This is disruption of the autonomic nervous system, and this is measurable with thermography, which looks at vasoconstriction secondary to sympathetic stimulation and heart rate variability, where we're looking at the power spectrum or distribution of different frequencies uh, when we look at the time between systoles, the interbeat intervals. Heart rate variability has been shown to correlate with a, a variety of adverse consequences. Um, All-cause mortality has been associated with heart rate variability. Uh, diabetics have impaired heart rate variability. Depression is associated with heart rate variability. Cognitive changes, memory, even cancer prognosis has been shown to be related to compromised heart rate variability. And studies have shown that chiropractic care to correct vertebral subluxations may improve heart rate variability and hopefully we'll be able to build that bridge between the basic science findings, the general clinical findings, and how we can apply this in practice to improve our clinical strategies. Another mechanism that's often overlooked is aphaptic transmission. And this refers to non-synaptic tr transmission of signals. Uh, aphaptic transmission occurs when electric fields activate neighboring cells 
without synaptic transmissions or gap junctions. In other words, these field effects influence the function of the nerve. Although technology to assess the phenomenon uh, in a clinical setting is currently lacking, the role of aphaptic transmission in cases of vertebral subluxation is speculative, but potentially exciting. And we have seen, through the use of advanced technology, some of the manifestations of vertebral subluxation and its correction. If we look at functional MRI, bold imaging, or blood oxygen level dependent imaging, basically what happens is when a cell metabolizes, it's going to utilize oxygen. So we see a change from hemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin, which changes the magnetization characteristics slightly and allows us to image them. So on the left, you can see the results of an MRI experiment we did prior to a chiropractic intervention and adjustment to corrective vertebral subluxation. You can see that we have bilaterally generalized regions of activation where you see these color swatches. Uh, this was when the person was attempting a unilateral ankle task, just moving one ankle but not the other. On the post study, we can see that instead of this generalized activation, we have specific activity, unilateral activity in the somatomotor cortex. And if we look at a slice that traditionally wouldn't be directly involved in voluntary motor function at all, uh, we see there's a little more activity here, uh, but we still see this generalized activation that is absent in the post study. Thank you for your attention. It's been my pleasure to share with you some of these exciting findings in the field of chiropractic.